So hi, um, I'm Alex, I'm the music analyst at Future Source, uh, and today I'm going to talk you through the next decade of music delivery. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the future revenue drivers of the music industry, uh, what could be the, the challenges, uh, but also give you an idea of um, how the competitive landscape uh, could look like uh, in the next few years. Um, but I couldn't really start this, uh, uh, this presentation without mentioning the fact that if I did this presentation one year ago, uh, the content would be totally different because COVID-19 had really a tremendous impact uh, on the current music ecosystem, but it's also have like a profound um, uh, effect on, on how the music ecosystem is going to uh, evolve uh, in, in the next uh, few years. Um, and for multiple reasons, you know, uh, the first one is the fact that COVID-19 really accelerated streaming adoption globally. Um, it also operated a shift in terms of consumption habits, uh, where you know before we had a very mobile-driven consumption, and that is now uh, uh, moving towards uh, a more home-focused uh, consumption. Mm. But COVID-19 also created uh, favorable grounds uh, for new content formats uh, and business model to thrive. You know, a great example is uh, concert live streaming. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is is you know, the, the, the advent of enhanced listening experiences. COVID-19 could really be a turning point uh, in this, the development of these uh, um, you know, uh, uh, great uh, listening experiences like you know, high res, but also immersive audio that could really strive uh, uh, during this, uh, uh, the next decade, this next decade of, of music delivery. But let's start with streaming. Um, you know, um, when we, we are still assessing, uh, you know, back in April, uh, the impact of COVID and trying to understand how, how uh, COVID could really impact the, the future of streaming. Um, we were expecting that um, the growth would be relatively unaffected in 2020 by COVID. And, and now with um, a bit more distance, uh, we can see that uh, COVID had, had an effect as actually accelerating streaming adoption. And so we expect at the end of 2020, uh, the global number of streaming subscribers uh, to reach 385 million. Um, and, and looking at 2024, uh, we expect this number to nearly double uh, to reach 720 million globally. Um, but when we look at this number, it's important to keep in mind that there are differences between markets. You know, there are markets like the Nordics, for example, that are nearing saturation, where we, we expect growth of streaming subscribers to slow down in the future. Uh, there are markets like you know, uh, the US and UK that are, are more mature stage, but there is still room for growth. Um, and you know, markets like Germany, Japan, and France are great example of, of markets that are, st are still very much in the growth phase and that we are still expect in the next uh, few years to see uh, strong levels of growth. Um, and finally, and most importantly for this next decade of music delivery, are these markets at an early stage, like for example, China, Brazil, Mexico that are really hugely populous uh, uh, markets, you know, and, uh, with a very strong appetite for technology, but also uh, uh, for streaming. So these markets are the ones that uh, we can expect are going to fuel the growth of streaming um, for the next years, and where uh, we can really expect a fierce competition between the players that are going to try to capitalize on this appetite for streaming uh, in these markets. So I mentioned about you know, this shift in terms of consumption. Um, of course, you know, we, we really hope that COVID is not going to last forever, you know, and we hope that it's only temporary. But there are some changes that, uh, that some evolutions that are going to be uh, brought as a result of COVID and that are going to stay in the long run. Uh, a great example is remote working. Uh, it's going to be now normal to, uh, to spend, you know, to have a, uh, to work from home a few days a week. Uh, and as a result, you know, there will be more time at home, less commute on travels, and there will be also a stronger focus on home entertainment as a result, and quality is going to be at the center uh, of this experience. But what we already see as well is, uh, you know, during these COVID times, is also that consumption is, is increasing in terms of like, you know, the type of devices that are used. We see that, uh, um, you know, uh, an increased use of, of smart speakers to access streaming or, or smart displays, but also gaming consoles which is a huge trend in 2020 and is going to continue in the future because 
there are new consoles that are, that are uh, being uh, launched. There is a, a new gaming platforms also that are uh, developing. So we can really expect that music and gaming, but also uh, um, you know, streaming consumption from gaming consoles is going to, to rise uh, in the future. And finally, you know, uh, uh, smart TVs and, and soundbars are also devices that, um, that are increasingly used to, uh, to consume streaming. Um, and, and the result of this is, is that it, it is fragmenting even more uh, uh, the ecosystem where you know, there are more and more devices that are used to access streaming than ever before. Um, but when we talk about fragmentations and differences, uh, you know, we discussed about you know, different stages of adoption for, for streaming, but what is particularly interesting as well is to look at smart speaker uh, adoption. Because over the past few years, um, it has really been uh, you know, the US, China, and also a bit the UK that were the driving force of the smart speaker adoption uh, uh, you know, globally. And, and even at the end of 2020, we still expect that 80% of the total smart speaker install base is going to be uh, in the US and China. So it's still very much driven by these two markets. Um, but Europe, it catching up. You know, we see uh, a rise in terms of smart speaker adoption, and it has a direct impact on, on, on streaming subscriptions because smart speakers are really easing the way uh, to streaming adoption. We've seen um, you know, uh, older demographics uh, that really transitioned and that became streaming users be even uh, without really realizing it because of you know, this seamless integration of streaming with voice and this convenience and this lean back experience that really makes it uh, you know, a, a very uh, easy experience and, and that we can see a, such a strong relationship between smart speaker and a streaming subscription, and even especially now during these COVID times where there is an increased consumption from smart speakers. But, but radio is not going away. You know, radio is, is still a, a, a key pillar in terms of music consumption. And what we also expect you know, in this next decade, and it's already happening very much now, is the fact that what makes radio unique, you know, the fact that there is there are personalities, you know, presenters, that there is like a curation of content, that there is this convenience of radio where you just have to switch it on uh, and listen and you don't have to like interact all the time. Um, we can already see that streaming services are integrated, uh, integrating these, uh, um, uh, these attributes to their products. We see Spotify, you know, heavily investing in podcasts, so bringing the storytelling element uh, uh, to Spotify. We see Apple Music that really at, at its core is uh, has radio, you know, since inception when they launched with Beats One and now they've just launched two other radio stations. So radio is still at the core of the expansion of, with Apple Music. And we talked about it a bit, but, uh, uh, you know, Amazon Music and, and the integration of, uh, of you know, the, the seamless integration of streaming with voice is also creating this lean back and convenient uh, experience that is very much characterized uh, by radio. So we talked a bit about podcast, but podcast is very much going to, uh, it's still at the beginning. You know, we see, uh, um, uh, you know, so, uh, like since 2019 and 2020, Spotify really heavily investing uh, in, in this format. We see now that uh, every uh, streaming service are investing in this, in this format. We've seen very recently Amazon or so. Um, so podcasts are still at an early stage and we can really expect that this next decade is going to really uh, see the evolution of the podcast ecosystem. Um, and, and Spotify is very much investing the most in your, currently in this, uh, in this sector. And we can really expect that they are going to continue because Spotify really wants to be uh, the leader in this market, but they also want to become the Netflix of podcasts. And the, the reason why I talk about Netflix of podcasts because they uh, want to be in this position where uh, users are going on Spotify because they they find they can, they go on Spotify to have the content that they cannot find elsewhere. You know this original and exclusive content. But for Spotify podcasts are also uh, particularly interesting to bring new people uh, on, on Spotify. You know these radio listeners, but also these uh, um, the audiences of really high profile personalities. Where when they do partnerships like Kim Kardashian or Michelle Obama, uh, uh, they aim at you know bringing their audiences, leveraging their audiences and and making sure that Spotify is the go-to platform to hear about their stories, but also to listen to music. And, and, and you know, the, this, this new development that, that happened a few 
uh, weeks ago that is significant. That's one of the biggest stories uh, of the year, you know, in terms of podcasts, is the fact that Spotify is now allowing podcasters to also uh, to include voice and music together within one show. And this is a huge development because it's getting closer and closer to a radio experience. And finally, for Spotify, uh, podcasts are a great way to monetize uh, their, their users. You know, at the end of the first half of 2020, they had 161 million free users. So podcasts are a great way to monetize these users. They are creating new opportunities to have like new ad products, but also they offer amazing uh, targeting capabilities because they are podcasts about everything. You know, they are podcasts about cosmetics, about fitness, about well-being, all of these, these specific subjects. And it's a great opportunity to really target very precisely these audiences. So for advertisers, it's great opportunity, but also for, for Spotify, it's a way to really increase the value of their inventory. But 2020 also has been the year of short form video content. And we can really, again, expect that this next decade is going to be driven by, by the rise of this, uh, this form of content. So TikTok introduced, uh, created this new type of you know, short form video content, and it really redefined uh, the way consumers engage with video content, but also discover music. Uh, we've seen uh, so many examples of songs that, 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 that went back in, in the charts as a result of TikTok. You know, the most recent example, you know, Fleetwood Mac Dreams uh, was released 43 years ago and it's back in, in, the, um, in the charts as a result of, of TikTok. You know, so TikTok is really driving discovery and driving also consumption. So it's putting a, a new emphasis of, on, on user generated content which is not a new concept, you know, it was already during the YouTube days, uh, you know, it, it, it was very much a, a part of the YouTube and it is very much part of the YouTube experience. But now there is a, a stronger emphasis on this type of content because it's driving a lot of value for the music industry through again, this discovery of music and, and this consumption. But of course, you know, the, um, the success of TikTok uh, is inspiring uh, other platforms, you know, so we can again expect that in the, in, in the next few years, you know, I know already now that, you know, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, they are all uh, uh, investing in this, in this domain and trying to, you know, replicate a similar type of experience and a similar concept, you know, with this short form video content and driving engagement on their platform, but also try to uh, not missing out on key advertising revenues. So we talked a lot about uh, uh, content, but now if we look at, uh, uh, you know, business models, uh, 2020 has been very much the year of Amazon, uh, and, and it really shows the, the strengths of, of, of this business model and the strengths of this, you know, uh, uh, content bundle. So during lockdown, uh, a lot of consumers become uh, prime members because they, they wanted to have uh, access to this free one day delivery. You know, Amazon was one of the most reliable way to get uh, deliveries, but they ended up also using prime video and prime music and you know, and maybe by an echo uh, because of that, you know, because of the strengths of this ecosystem. And, you know, this next decade is very much going to be this decade of bundling. Uh, and we already see it with Apple that uh, is going to are already released uh, Apple One, you know, this content bundle. Uh, because for Apple, it's a great opportunity to simplify the, user, the customer experience with you know, one single billing relationship where you have one, one subscription accessing all of these different services instead of multiple subscriptions. But it's also offering um, more services in one package where for the price of, you know, uh, um, Apple Music and Apple TV Plus, you have also access to cloud storage and gaming and other type of apps. Uh, but also importantly, these, these vendors, they are creating synergies between the different services. So we talked about, you know, Amazon Prime where people are becoming prime members to free, for free delivery, but they end up also using prime video, for example. And we could, could, could always see this situation where uh, subscribers to Apple one day, they listen to, uh, to Apple Music, but they end up also um, using Apple TV, Apple TV Plus instead of Netflix because it's part of this, uh, of this bundle. And we can also expect that you know, the growth of one service could benefit the others again because of this bundling effect. And it could help uh, search and discovery with interlinks between apps, you know, and, and you know, creating like this uh, ecosystem where uh, you you could push content in one app uh, and, and for another one, you know, for example, creating like interlinks between apps. But most importantly, uh, it's about strengthening this ecosystem of product and services, and 
Apple has always been good at, you know, uh, at pushing the ecosystem where, you know, for example, very recently when, if you have a HomePod mini and you have an iPhone, then you have access to all of these apps. So we can really expect that this seamless integration of Apple services within their products is going to be even stronger uh, in the future. But so it really shows the strengths of this ecosystem and the value of these, these super aggregators. But again, 2020 has seen the rise of concept live streaming. It's not, again, a new concept, but COVID-19 really pushed it to, uh, to the mainstream because it was one of the, the main way for artists and, and fans to uh, come together and to engage with each other. So at the beginning, it was under the form of a free experience, but we can really expect that in the future it's going to move to a more uh, ticketed live experience. So we see a lot of investments and of, a lot of fundraisings raising for uh, companies like, you know, uh, Moment House or so like Drift, Sessions, Maestro, Stage It, but also Mixcloud. All of these platforms are really rising at the moment because they are becoming a key alternatives to the decreasing revenues from live, uh, live concerts, you know. Um, and, and this concert live streaming could be really an amazing opportunity to push immersive technologies to the mainstream. You know, we can, we could imagine like virtual reality experiences, like immersive audio experiences, all of these, it could be a, a, a sort of a experimentation lab, you know, uh, for these technologies and, and to promote them to the mainstream. But when concerts are going to go back, it's still possible that a concert live streaming could become uh, an additional revenue streams for, for, for the industry. Uh, as long as you know that these experiences are, as, are immersive enough, that they bring this social element, you know, a, a concert is, is, is about the crowd, you know, what makes a concert special is the crowd. Uh, so bringing, if they can bring, you know, this social element, but also uh, there are a lot of consumers that are willing to pay hundreds of dollars to go to a, to a concert. Um, and it's because it's, it doesn't happen that often. It's because it's special, it's unique and exclusive. So all of these elements um, are what makes the value of concerts, concerts and why people are willing to pay a lot of money for these uh, experiences. So if live streaming is able to integrate this, uh, these elements into their products, it will create a lot of value for both consumers, but they can also create uh, and extract a lot of value from that, from that situation. And my last point, um, is about you know the the enhanced listening experiences. So COVID nineteen could be really a turning point uh, uh, to really uh, bring these uh, these uh, experiences to the mainstream. We've seen a lot of uh, consumers upgrading to fiber uh, to be able to work from home, for example. So now they are able to also access higher quality content. We see also streaming services that you know where the competition is so fierce that now you know with uh, if they can bring some uh, uh, new uh, listening experiences uh, could really be a differentiator for them and, and you know, create a unique experience uh, on their platform. And, and we know that there is a demand for it because uh, we ran a consumer survey um, a few months ago um, and we found that 42% of consumers uh, that, ha that are streaming users said that they want better audio quality from their service. And it was the number one feature that they wanted. Um, so there is a demand for it. And we see also uh, uh, audio brands that are uh, launching new products with audio quality uh, at the core of their offering. And a lot of investment in 3D audio technology, like, you know, very recently with Apple, but also Amazon and Dolby Atmos partnering. Um, so really, when we see all of these developments, all of these technologies and the rise of these immersive experiences, uh, there have never been a better time to be a music fan. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this next decade. Thank you.